those are two really great choices. Thank you. Now, the next film I'd like to talk about is Foolish Wives. Set in Monte Carlo, this 1921 film stars its writer and director, Eric von Stroheim, as a con artist who pretends to be an exiled aristocrat in order to seduce wealthy women. Stroheim realized Foolish Wives in exacting detail, with every last object in the frame playing some part in his master plan. In telling this sometimes lurid story, he drew heavily on the modernist literature of his period and on the realist novels of the previous generation. This is noticeable not only in the title cards, but in the way he combines characters and details to construct a larger portrait of society. Before I saw Foolish Wives, I felt that movies could only imitate other art forms. They could be novelistic, but they couldn't absorb the essence of novels. But here, von Stroheim proves that movies can not only imitate other parts of culture, but that they can equal them. The next film I'd like to talk about is Playtime, by the French director and comic performer Jacques Tati. Though Tati is the star of the film, his character is just a tiny part of a vast comic tapestry set mostly in an ultra-modern block of buildings in Paris and shot in ultra-crisp 70 millimeter. This 1967 movie is, for me, perhaps the definitive big screen experience. <laughs> the film is composed almost entirely of wide shots, where dozens of actors perform comic bits at various rhythms. Tati believed that comedy belonged to everyone, and in playtime, he allows us to peer into his compositions and decide for ourselves what to focus on. Take a look at this scene set in a restaurant. Playtime is a different film every time you see it. With every viewing, you become aware of more and more details and patterns. While Foolish Wives helped me realize that movies could not only imitate, but equal any other media, such as art or literature or theater, the complexity and the density of the comedy in Playtime made me understand that movies had the ability to surpass other forms. This film is without precedent or equal in any other medium, and it convinced me that because it's able to absorb everything else we've created, cinema is capable of being the pinnacle of culture. I love how varied your picks are, and that would be very, very cool to see playtime on the big screen in 70 millimeter. Hard to find, but worth tracking down. My next choice is a more recent film, Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. The saga of crime and carnage along the Rio Grande emerges as the Cohen brothers' masterpiece. In adapting Cormac McCarthy's novel about the repercussions of a drug deal gone bad, the writing and directing brothers created an evocative, bleak landscape with help from their usual cinematographer, the great Roger Deakins. Javier Bardem is chilling in his Oscar-winning supporting turn as an eccentric serial killer. Call it. Call it, yes. For a whole lot. Just call it. Well, we need to know what we're calling it for here. You need to call it. I can't call it for you. Well, it wouldn't be fair. I didn't put nothing up. Yes, you did. You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. You know what date is on this coin? No. 1958. It's been traveling 22 years to get here, and now it's here. Josh Brolin plays a welder and Vietnam vet who stumbles upon the drug deal's bloody aftermath. He finds a briefcase stuffed with $2 million in cash and runs off with it, but he has no idea what he's gotten himself Wait, into. I'm guessing this isn't the future you had pictured for yourself when you first clapped eyes on that money. Don't worry, I'm not the man who's after you. I know that. I've seen him. You've seen him? I mean, you're not dead. Huh. Is this guy supposed to be the ultimate badass? 
No, I don't think that's how I'd describe him. Well, how would you describe him? Well, I guess I'd say he doesn't have a sense of humor. Tommy Lee Jones, the old man of the title, is the heart of the film as a Texas sheriff who's tracking both these men and finding that he no longer knows the territory or its inhabitants as well as he used to. Money and the drugs. It's just down beyond everything. What's it mean? What's it leading to? You know, if you'd have told me 20 years ago, I'd see children walking the streets of our Texas towns with green hair, bones in their noses. I just flat out wouldn't have believed you. Signs and wonders. But I think once you quit hearing sir and ma'am, the rest is soon to follow. No Country for Old Men won four Academy Awards in 2008, including Best Picture. And when it came time to pick the best films of the past decade, No Country was at the top of my list. I love the elegance of its ending, and it moves me again and again. Now, No Country for Old Men is a film with a lot of moral issues at the heart of it. And I believe that cinema is better suited than any other medium for discussing morality. Because I believe that the Holocaust is probably humanity's greatest moral failure, I can think of no greater moral problem in cinema than how to go about depicting this genocide. Few films have taught me more about what it means to make films morally and about the moral weight that images can carry than Shoah, Claude Lanzmann's 1985 nine-hour documentary on the Holocaust. It is a film that illustrates by example. Das Kernstück des Lagers war natürlich die Gaskammern. Man baute also zu die Gaskammern zunächst in den Wald hinein oder in Treblinka auf das Feld. Es waren überhaupt die Gaskammern das einzige Steingebäude im ganzen Lager. Alles andere waren Holzbaracken. Es waren ja die Vernichtungslager nur auf Zeit angelegt. Lanzmann avoids using any historical footage in making the documentary. All of the images that appear in Shoah take place in the present and were shot specifically for the film by the great cinematographer William Lubchansky. Describing an event in the past by looking only at the present reinforces the idea that history isn't just something that happened long ago, but something we will always have to live with. Amazingly little was newly invented until, of course, the moment came when one had to go beyond that which had already been established by precedent and one had to gas these people or, in some sense, annihilate them on a large scale. Then these bureaucrats became inventors. But like all, all inventors of institutions, they did not copyright or patent their achievements and they prefer obscurity. Building a work of art around a great tragedy can get you into some ethically questionable territory. But Lanzmann's approach steps around the thorny moral issue of using images that represent so much pain to others in order to improve your own work. Lanzmann's film is a lesson in how to approach a subject responsibly. And for me, it's not only a reminder of what filmmakers can do, but also of what they should do.